Thank you for joining us this evening. On behalf of the Boston University Initiative on Cities, BU Diversity and Inclusion, and WBUR City Space, it is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's conversation, Black Boston, Transforming the Arts. This is our fourth and final, for now, discussion in our series with transformative Black leaders from across Boston. My name is Catherine Lusk. I serve as co-director of the Initiative on Cities alongside Professor Graham Wilson. Together with our partners, we conceived of the series as a way to learn from the incredible Black women and men who are leading Boston in this pivotal time and helping to chart a new course for future generations. We wanted to better understand what progress has been made and where inequities and racism may endure in four of the foundational building blocks of any vibrant city, representative government, respected journalism, robust community health, and enriching arts. Today's discussion, Transforming the Arts, was originally scheduled for March 2020. We could never have predicted the racial reckoning that's taking place and the simultaneous strain the pandemic has placed on the arts community here in Boston and around the world. And yet it is more important than ever that the arts exist and thrive to lift people up, foster empathy and understanding, help us escape sometimes from tragedy and other times confront injustice. I'll briefly introduce today's panelists before I turn it over to our moderator, BU VP and Associate Provost for Community and Inclusion, Crystal Williams, who will lead the conversation with you all. Tonight, we are joined by some remarkable leaders who are transforming the Boston arts community. First, I welcome Makiba McCreary, the Patty and Jonathan Kraft Chief of Learning and Community Engagement with the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, where she leads institution-wide efforts to deepen engagement with audiences reflect the diversity of our surrounding community. Makiba is a native Bostonian who previously served as managing director and senior advisor of external affairs at the Boston Public Schools, where she focused on STEM initiatives. We're also joined tonight by Catherine T. Morris, the founder and executive director of BAMS Fest, the Boston Art and Music Soul Fest, a nonprofit created to break down racial and social barriers to art, music, and culture through an annual festival, signature events, and strategic partnerships. In the last 15 years, Catherine has devoted her time to producing shows and mobilizing and engaging local audiences to experience in the arts, including as director of public programs at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. We also welcome Maurice Emanuel Parent, the executive director of the Front Porch Arts Collective, which is a black theater company committed to advancing racial equity in Boston through theater. He is also professor of the practice with the Tufts University Department of Theater, Dance and Performance Studies and visiting lecturer of music theater at Boston University. He previously served as co-acting artistic director of the Actor Shakespeare Project, where he is a resident acting company member. He's received two Elliott Norton Awards, three Independent Reviewer of New England Awards and an Arts Impulse Award. And I'll say we're also so delighted today's discussion will be facilitated by our co-host and friend, Crystal Williams. As I mentioned, Crystal is Vice President and Associate Provost for Community and Inclusion at Boston University, as well as a professor of English and an award-winning poet. At BU, she created new programs, including the University Scholars, Target of Opportunity Hiring, and the Inclusive Pedagogy Initiative. She previously served as Associate VP for Strategic Initiatives and Professor of English at Bates College, and is a faculty member and inaugural Dean for Institutional Diversity at Reed College. And lastly, I just wanna say thank you to our team at BU and WBUR for making this series possible. It has been over a year in the making now, and it is incredibly gratifying to have it all come to fruition, due in no small, small part to the great work of Alana Anderson, David Gross, Fahima Blanca Munoz, Alex Schneps, and Amy McDonald. Thank you all to our partners, thank you to our speakers, and thank you to those of you tuning, tuning in this evening. Crystal, over to you. Thank you, Catherine. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to B Black Boston, Transforming the Arts. I'm delighted that you've joined us for this conversation, and I've been looking forward to talking with Catherine, Makiba, and Maurice. Um, but before we jump in, I'd also want to thank WBUR. I want to thank Catherine Lusk, our co-director of BU's Initiative on Cities Extraordinaire, and she really is extraordinary, uh, and her wonderful crew. I want to thank Alonda Anderson, our director of programs in my unit, BU Diversity and Inclusion, for their work in urging this series forward. And I want to 
also thank you folks for being here with us and for participating in what I think is an increasingly important conversation about black arts and transformation in Boston. Um, we're gonna structure this conversation into the following themes, history and context, power structures and impact, the pandemic and the future, the art and the vision for the future. So those are the ways in which we're gonna just have a conversation. Uh, in relation to question and answers, we want you also to be part of this conversation. So if you have a question, you can send it to us by going to Slido, so that's S-L-I-D-O dot com, and using the event code Black Boston, so that's all one word, all lowercase, uh, and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can. Uh, we are streaming live from the WBUR City Space YouTube channel, to which you can subscribe. To find out more about their events and programming, you can go to wbur.org backslash uh, city space. So let's let's dig in if, if, if we can, folks. Um, I wanna just get to, so I'm relatively new to Boston. I, I'm gonna claim that for the next 15 years. So it's been three years and I'm interested um, given your longevity and your experiences here and the fact that you reflect so many you know, different genres. I'm interested uh, in your description. If you were to describe Boston's black arts uh, scene for a newcomer, uh, and maybe in relation to like a SWOT analysis, so strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats, how would you describe Boston's black art scene? Are you going to make me call on one of you? I'm going to, really? I thought Catherine was going to start. Yeah, okay. I'll start. <laughs> um, in the native all my life. So for me, if I were to tell you coming in that, that the black art scene in Boston is rich, it's historical, it's uh, generational, it's complex, it's segregated, but it has the opportunity to shift, change, and challenge how the city views Black arts of where it has been, where it is, and where it could be. Okay. How about Maurice? Sure. Um, I just want to uh, piggyback on what Catherine already said. Is rich. It's um, goes all the way back uh, in terms of theater. Rich it has a, a long history. The legacy uh, goes all the way back to the 20s and 30s up through into today. I think um, it's segregated and also has to uh, fight against national narratives that are not fair to this city. I am uh, a transplant and I agree. I've, I've been here over 16 years, but I still feel like I'm, <laughs> there's many ways I'm still very new to Boston. And I think yeah. it's, um, and I do mean this, I think there's so much to this city that you can constantly be learning and learning about your communities. And I think an opportunity is how, especially, especially when we're talking about black art, how unique I think the black community of Boston is in the nation about how beautifully diverse it is. And, um, but some threats are, I think, um, unfortunately, the, particularly in the theater, then um, those that have been telling the narratives the most or most publicly have been predominantly white institutions and, uh, and opportunities that we are seeing that changing. Makiba, how would you build on that or differ? I want to just also check, is my um, connection poor or it's okay? Oh. Okay, great. Okay. Um, Yes to all those beautiful things, all very true. Um, I'm also native and um, came up through an arts background. I would say what I've learned or what resonates for me most recently in this past like seven to eight months is are, are frankly the threats and the threats that are internal to our own community, um, right? Like the, the permission that we are waiting for to um, just just step into all of those beautiful things and say like, we, this is our city. We own the city. We, um, we, we share it, you know, we're, we're, we're open to sharing space, but we don't have to take the, um, the second sort of the, the second step forward. We should take the first step step forward. And if that could start to, and I think there's young people that are ready to do that. I actually would think that it's probably, um, and you know, the generations before the, 20 somethings um, and 30 somethings that have been more reticent to hang back. I think that they are ready to do that. And I, I think the more we can encourage them um, to really take up space, um, the more the, the, the fabric of the city will change and the more we will see of black arts. 
So, so Makiba, I want to just dig into that a little bit because what what actually would that look like if this young this new generation of folks digs in and steps up and steps in? What does that look like that is different than the four of us who are um, not twenty somethings anymore? <laughs> right. right. Um, well, so resources are real, right? Like we've all talked about resources being real. And I think that might be an area where we do have to be supportive and we do have to go to the local philanthropies and say, like, you know, we, we can't just give these young people pennies to get their work done. We need to make sure that they can eat. We need to make sure they can pay their rent. We need to pay, make sure that they can they can be full artists if that's what they, they want to pursue. Um, just like we do for, you know, frankly, white and white artists, white institutions. Like if, if there's a small black theater company, if there's a small black, um, you know, opera, whatever the case might be, they need the money too. And then I think um, they need the real estate. <laughs> like these are the things that are, you know, you don't get taught how to, to, to figure out how to, to find, but you need a place to have your art shown. You need an audience then to come. And I think the, the, the audience will is waiting to show up but i do think we need to show up more right like i think you've seen that maurice in your productions where you know the conversation is about our experience and the, it's filled with the white people <laughs> that are you know between 50 and 60 years old like it blows my mind every time that we aren't showing up in that way so those are the three i think the three ingredients fundamentally that would have to happen so we're right now straddling on this the question of um, power and structure and impact because you've started to talk about resources. And I want to just hover here for one more second because Maurice and Catherine both, I think, um, have been doing work and also Makiba um, in relation to audience building and um, really targeting uh, Boston's black community. So I'm interested in your thinking about that in relation to what actually is going on holistically in Black Arts Boston? Yeah, um, uh, I'll, I'll start with that. I think, um, thank you for bringing it up. I think you have to be intentional about rewriting narratives. You have to be intentional about making spaces welcoming. You have to be intentional about and genuine about how you want to engage with communities and particularly communities of color that have been there, done that, have been uh, the recipient of um, disingenuous engagement or disingenuous reaching out. So you have to be very intentional. Like, um, so the front porch, we're partnering with uh, some predominantly white institutions to do narratives that focus on uh, 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 stories within the African diaspora. And then we built a blackout performance night where we took a show off sale and targeted um, black organizations and black leaders to please bring in their constituents so we can um, rewrite the narrative because we know that the theatrical space um, due to white supremacist culture tends to be predominantly white and predominantly older so i have to be very intentional about rewriting that narrative and then this is something i'm still working through myself but um you walk into seeing a show about your story on stage and then you ask the why why is this being produced and but why is this being produced by this company and then you hope that it's uh not to get donor funds or to make anyone feel good is for you genuinely want to you value this narrative you value these people and um you value their presence in your space and realize adding folks to your space means the space is new you have to be willing to change it so maurice just a, a an aside last year sometime i went to a theater which i will not name uh and they uh, there was a play that i was interested to see about black people and i think i was uh, my theater coach, so theater is my first love, so I was there with my old theater coach uh, who had flown in from Detroit, just right, because there was a kid on stage who went to our high school. Um, and I was struck by the fact that I think we were the only two black people in the audience. Um, I was struck by the performativity of blackness in the play. I was struck by the play itself, right? Um, and wondered what would this play look and feel like? What would its, um, what response would it get in a Detroit, right? A very different kind of space. Um, and I have found that to be true. I, you know, I go to theater, I go to dance, I go to lots of things in Boston. And it's almost always the case that I'm one of a very few brown people in the audience, um, which I find really depressing, actually. Um, 
Catherine, you, you're you a native Bostonian. What What is that about? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Um, <laughs> I just want to speak to something really quick that Maurice was talking about is the work of Bands Fest at the core of it is either to change space or create space. And one requires real estate resources. Um, there's not enough black and brown venues owned and operated by us. So the very institutions that exist can make a choice whether they want our content or not. And then we have to work within those parameters to make it fit. But it doesn't necessarily mean the institution changes to adopt to what the, the culture of that audience needs to feel socially accepted, welcomed, and, and appreciated with the content they're being presented. So we have that problem, which is historical to Boston. Um, a lot of the older institutions, theaters, uh, concert venues, halls, were all predicated on a certain kind of art, certain kind of music that perpetuate a certain kind of culture in this city that has had a physical, mental, psychological, spiritual um, effect on how I think black and brown people have viewed the art because we haven't had the many access points of what we deserve to have access to. So we only know certain types of art to experience, music being one of those, not necessarily theater, not necessarily um, anything else. And it's very unfortunate because that's, that's what uh, keeps me up in that about how do we change people's, not just the narrative, but the perception that Boston has already had the fundamentals of black arts here. The problem is, is that the platforms that, that support it are very few and they're not owned and managed by us, it's by other institutions. So how we act, how we respond, how we perceive the arts in general, I'm not surprised anymore just because of the historical context of how this city was built and how it is continuously structured until we actually either build it or that there's an institution authentically willing to shift, shape, mold, listen, be proactive, and be intentional about working in different ways of welcoming different audiences and the content that comes with it that represents their narrative. So this is a conversation about power, right? Um, and um, structure. And so can you three talk a little bit about, I mean, Catherine just, <laughs> she just put it all on the table. So let's just delve into what she put on the table. So how does power um, in this city and the way power works in the city impact both the arts broadly and then more specifically black arts? And how might it be different than like New York, for instance? I'm not sure I'm going to exactly answer your question, Crystal, but I do want to speak to like the, when you say power, that triggers for me something about the previous question around audience, right? And um, it, that's a huge part of the work that I'm doing here at the museum, obviously, but you know, it, it's become even clearer to me that it cannot just be a check the box because um, one person does not change or shift the conversation. And when Maurice talks about narrative, I think like there's a literal conversation that happens in the galleries when seven black people are looking at an object or painting and everybody else overhears them. Whatever they're saying, it doesn't matter. They might be saying the exact same thing that the seven white people just said when they were in front of, but it's coming from black people. And that actually does matter, particularly in this city. Um, and I think, you know, power perhaps is actually saying that it does matter that we need black people. And it's not about diversity. It's not about share, you know, having a little bit of everybody in the space. We actually need to, to balance the scales. And in order to do that, um, we need to privilege the conversation of audience being about black and brown. We need to privilege the, the presence of um, art and artists that are black and brown because one does not make, one is not going to make a dent. We are so far behind in that sense. So I, that, I'll just say that and I'll, I may come back later and answer your question better, but um, I want to say that. And I too wonder if I'm going to exactly answer the question, but something that's been heavy on my heart lately is how are we encouraging the whole artist? 
So you choose to be an artist in Boston, yes, to make your art, but also to be a, an inhabitant of Boston, be part of the culture here, be part of your community, your neighborhood. So how are you, we, how are you supporting them? How is the city supporting them? And how are they be able to make carve out lives for themselves? They want to buy homes, they want to buy cars, they want to have family, just like everybody else in the other sector. And um, I think there's not enough con this conversation about what the product is and what um, you know the audience is, uh, the patrons are consuming in these art spaces, and that's important. And then where that art is coming from is important, and the conversations that are leads to are important. But also, who? What about the body creating that art? You know, how are they upheld and and supported? Because um, I think uh, you know the artists do drive the arts economy of Boston as well as as much as the patrons as well as much as the administrators. And I do have to give some shine and love to. Um, I'm seeing uh, a lot of my colleagues uh, rise in the ranks of different theatrical institutions. Um, there's certainly more black leadership across the board. My colleague is. Um, Don Simmons is the executive director of Stage Source um, uh, and uh, a theater advocacy group. And, um, you know, we need some more black women up there, but we're seeing some changes happening. So um, I think when we talk about power and who who is who is who's in those conversations in the rooms where it happens, to quote Hamilton, we are seeing more black and brown folks. But how are they how are they empowered? You know, what voice are they given? You know, are they are they are they being set up for success or being set up for failure? Um, these are the questions that are in my mind these days. Well, how many I mean, has anybody what is the what is your sense of so arts? So any organization has a board typically. Right. So what is the relationship between race and representation and leadership on arts boards? That's one. Um, what is the relationship between um, these sort of racial equity funds that have emerged? I think there are three of them now. Um, and supporting arts, the arts economy, as well as the business economy. So I'm interested to understand the nitty gritty of how the money works and who is making decisions. Right? Can I, can I take the board question? Yes, please. <laughs> I'll let you two off the hook. I'm going to take the board question. It's huge. It is critical. It is um, particularly for institutions that rely, you know, so significantly on the dollars of their um, individual contributors, which who tend to be in governance um, and leadership roles. Um, it's the business proposition, right? It's the value proposition of who do we who do we fundamentally care about? Who do we need to care about to stay alive and to survive? And uh, I think that the knee-jerk reaction has has been maybe not knee-jerk, but just the 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 consideration to date has been that it's whoever can write the check, right? But that's actually really not true. It's it's whoever we are of value to, and so I often I, I say to people all the time here, a fa a, a, a family of two with one child can go to the movies once, buy popcorn, soda, and one candy and spend lot more, sorry, spend more than they would spend to buy a family membership here at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, right? So they are making a choice about what the value proposition is for them. And we've already made a choice that we actually, up until, you know, um, I feel like the past few years is we're shifting here, but um, historically we and other institutions, culture institutions in Boston have been very clear about who we value. And that's that that's evident. And so, you know, you draw a line in the sand and people choose to go elsewhere and they don't choose to make this their institution. But we also lose out because we don't believe quite yet that we will we will fall, we will crumble, we will absolutely die unless we become relevant to the community, the city of Boston. Now, in some ways, the pandemic has actually been in that sense a blessing in disguise because we, just like a lot of your institutions, we are wholly reliant now on people who can walk here, who can drive here, who are, are less than 30 minutes away, as opposed to people who are getting on planes, flying in from another country for you know an amazing weekend in Boston. So we're being forced to, to really ask the question, for whom are we here, you know? And governance matters, sorry, I mean, that's the whole point. The board matters because they are the ones who has historically made that decision. I do have to give a shout out to my new board president, yes. Edward Green. He is the first black man to be president of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. 
Um, and that matters because he is in a decision making role and, and that's where it counts. Do we know if other boards of arts of, of large arts organizations in the city um, have representation? Do we I, have I mean, I would say holistically that um, if they do, they're not making it known and you have to dig for it, which is a problem, right? It's um, to, to your question about race and representation. So how I look at that from a board perspective, from a staffing perspective, from a senior leadership perspective is, you know, race counts for something over here. Representation is about a set of experiences, values, um, and identity. And that's to me what matters on a board is that all of that combined leads to advocacy, agency, and transparency about what matters to what McKeever is saying and the value proposition. Getting into this work, you know, almost now 10 years, my initial question were, where are all of the black and brown, where, where are the wealthiest black and brown people in Boston? Because they're not, I don't know them. I can tell you every Jewish person, I can tell you every other race except my own. And yet when I'm in these rooms now, um, people start to see the value of what I'm bringing that is the very fight for them to be on those boards and those power, powerful decisions to advocate for the work that we do so that Black arts can survive, thrive, and succeed. So now the, the current has changed where we're starting to see that. But gosh, I wish that was more prevalent years ago. And I don't know what the fear is, but arts does matter. Again, in Boston, though, it's the kind of art. And that paradigm has to really shift because that will affect future leaders on boards or in, or in their own movements about what do you value the most about Black arts? that's gonna manifest to something greater. So Catherine, you just said two things that are, are both fascinating and troubling to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One, you said that the kind of art that people will support and or engage is important. And I'm, can you just open that up a little bit? And then the second thing you said was that Boston's black elite are not engaged with, I think this is what I heard you say, Boston's black arts community. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to bite my tongue only because you shouldn't, I just want to be, <laughs> when I'm, you know, when I'm in the circles of, um, you know, the, the front porch arts collectives, the black cotton clubs or the hipsteries or the pro blacks, um, we can sit around the table and, and really talk about, so we're, where are the, the black wealthy people? Because they're not hanging around. Obviously, you know, for whatever those reasons are, but it plays a psychological effect about, you know, is graffiti art valued as art for black for the black experience? Is hip hop music valued as part of the black art experience in Boston? And considering that we're a city of, you know, being the first, the only, um, or the oldest in many historical things, that mindset does does have an effect on the generation that dictates what is valuable art, particularly in the in the Boston Black community, that that stifles what what communities have access to. That is troubling. So when I think about the world of music in Boston, uh, when I was starting my festival, it's like you know you have to have traditional jazz. No, no, no. You have to have uh, um, this kind of jazz. You know, this is the real jazz over that jazz. I'm like. But well, all of it's a part of the Black arts experience. Why are we fighting? But I realize that's a generational thing versus if I'm talking to, you know, a 20-something-year-old, they'll say that hip-hop should be the focus. But it's all relevant to Black to, to Boston's Black arts scene, real, you know, regardless. Same thing with, with theater, is that any any theater company that is Black and, black and Brown-owned that is taking a different approach to presenting, you know, our narratives, may be seen as a rebel to what Boston has historically done around telling our narratives years ago. And that might not blend with the old generation, but it might be actually necessary for the future generations coming up because they want to see more of that. And that the approach of getting that message out is going to look much different than what it was 10, 15 years ago. 
So I hear you saying also um, that there's a level of provinciality that is um, impacting the progression and transformation of Black arts in Boston. Um, th this, this group of power elite folks have a kind of provincial attitude towards art and what is valuable and what is not valuable, which in my newbie experience, there is a level of provincialism here in Boston that I haven't experienced in other places that I find super interesting. Um, if, I'll just leave it there. I'll just say it's super interesting. Um, there, so I just wanna, there's an audience question that I wanna ask, cause I think it may be related to this and related to this idea of provinciality um, and the way th that that mindset impacts arts and its production and support. So Boston uh, is a higher ed, I mean, there are so many institutions of higher education here, right? Um, and so the question is, how would you like to see higher ed institutions leverage their substantial resources to support Boston's black creativity? What works and what doesn't? Hire us. <laughs> um, you know, I think, uh, and we're exploring some models like this. What is it to be an artist in residence? Um, I think uh, uh, for different universities, I, I teach at a few, <laughs> and um, it's a really great um, and impactful thing I get to do to engage with uh, these young Black students who maybe come from. A Detroit or the DC area or whatever, where they're used to being the norm and then having this culture shock of coming to these, you know, these universities in Boston and being not only a minority, but the only oftentimes. And I think that it's a twofold. It's how can you support the, the black art scene and the black artists making art in Boston? Then how can that enrich the students who is your number one priority? How, how can they feel connected to community and a place of belonging when they are in such a state of shock? And I mean, it's, it's well known that when black people enter um, predominantly white spaces, there's a guard that goes up. And how can you learn when your guard is up, particularly when you're learning the arts? So, you know, that is a way to process with that, um, uh, uh, put, you know, the, the survival, um, the survival instinct that gets thrown up by a lot of these young folks is engaging them with the art makers in Boston. And I think it's just a mutual beneficial relationship and opportunity. Ooh, ooh, can I answer this question? I'm sorry. It's on the, okay, thank you. So I wrote down a list. So whoever's listening, hope you're prepared. All right, so to Maurice's point, all these institutions that have arts and residency programs, please change your criteria to be more localized to black and brown artists. That's number one. Two, for professors, uh, adjunct faculty that are able and have the budget to um, bring in guest speakers, artists are content providers. They can talk about what it means to survive and grow in Boston, and they are the direct contact and connection that your students need to understand how to maneuver in this city beyond its institutional walls. Um, all, uh, uh, all higher ed institutions are in the business of real estate. So even things that are not on their campus, um, they do have access to, and they can leverage for rehearsal space, performances, conversation, you name it. Um, during the summer, uh, when we get out of COVID, uh, a lot of the housing that is up can be used for artists to have over the summer. Um, so, you know, th those are rooms that could be rented for a very low fee that, you know, artists are struggling trying to find housing. Again, uh, higher education is into the business of real estate. Um, all the uh, student groups that exist that are both um, non-Black and Black-led, um, this is a fine opportunity for them to um, integrate more local artists and not necessarily always try to go for the national artists. But first, they have to know where, um, you know, those resources, community groups, collectives, musicians, all those historical venues that that celebrate and uplift black uh, Boston black arts exist. And what that leads to is that college universities have to change the way they do their marketing material that attracts uh, talent here to the city. A lot of the times it is white. A lot of the times it's white men and white women um, of a certain age or a certain kind of lifestyle that perpetuates what the city is. What the city is. So start including more black people. Start including. Start naming um, 
the institutions or the or the the venues or the collectors of social movements uh, that support the Boston Black the Boston uh, Black art scene here. Include that in your brochure. You might be surprised, you know, how more enticing that might be for student contemplating to come to Boston to come to university or college. An excellent list that you produced relatively <laughs> in such a short period of time. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> um, I, there's another question here that uh, I think is probably, I, I'm not sure when would be a good time to ask it, so I'm going to ask it now because it seems like an important question. So the mayor uh, has declared racism a public health crisis, uh, and the, the audience um, member wants to know, how might arts advocacy foreground artists as essential to individual and community well-being? So what can we do, right, to, to really put forward the narrative and the truth that the artists of us in the world are essential to our community's well-being? Well, it, it actually is that true. I positioned it I as a hundred percent. Like, I, you know, that's not even really, I don't think we talk about it enough. I don't think we actually are declarative about that enough that like we actually have a responsibility. Um, we have a, the museum has a responsibility to use its collection to contribute um, safety, well-being, spiritual um, expansion, um, love, tension. Like we can do all of that with what we have within these walls here. Um, and we should, we should do that. And I think we, again, learned something in the past six to eight months about the fact that um, there is much healing to be done. Um, but before we can heal, we actually, I think we really have to tell the truth about what it, what it is like to be a person of color in this city. Forget about the rest of the country. Let's just talk about in Boston. Um, I can't think of a better place to have those conversations. I, I really can't. I mean, and I think we need to stop being let off the hook for um, not having to participate in those hard conversations, not having to both own the fact that the narratives that we choose to put first when you come into our spaces um, are not inclusive. Um, they, they cancel out um, a lot. Of, they cancel out anybody who's not white, dead, and a male. That's it, you know? And so, so that has to change. Um, but once, once that happens and we start to own that, um, I've, seen, I've seen in small moments this become a place that becomes owned by young Black artists. I mean, honestly, Rob Gibbs, Rob Stull, I, you have to watch them. They, they walk in here with their badges like they own this, this institution. It is a beautiful thing. And they do, and nobody questions it. And they have, it hasn't been, you know, a simple transition, but um, people, when you, when you meet them, when you see them next, ask them what that felt like, because that, that needs to be the, the norm, I think. And that's the thing we have to start to foster in all of our institutions, big or small. Maurice, w w thank you, uh, Makiba. Maurice, in, in your blackout spaces, um, can you, I mean, w a, can you first describe what it is for folks who might not have experienced a blackout? And two, can you talk through what the, what you, what, how people have responded to blackout um, in relation to well being, communal health, et cetera? Sure. Um, I have a few things I want to say. So I'll start with, with describing the blackout. The blackout was a, uh, uh, Inspired by a slave play on Broadway, Jeremy o. Harris uh, filled an entire Broadway theater of 800, 800 folks who identified as being part of the African diaspora because the show dealt with some um, challenging themes that are unique to blackness and also uh, black America, a black American being having your lineage be from American slavery. So um, knowing that themes like that on the stage are most easily uh, are, are can be consumed more easily when you know you are with family. And that's what Blackout Boston does, making a family experience. And that's what it was for Choir Boys. So um, we we reached out and we said, is it cool if we do that here in Boston? And we're like, yep. So we did Blackout Boston. So we used to play Choir Boy that, again, dealt with um, 
uh, African American culture on stage, and in particularly, in particular, the show didn't do didn't look at blackness in relationship to whiteness, which I think is something that needs to be talked about more in the theater. Like how you yeah you're telling stories about black folks, but is it uh, about black folks or is it are you still centering whiteness in your storytelling so that didn't so it was a night we took off sale from public so it wasn't you know a lot of folks were saying that you know it's just discriminatory and exclusionary whatever it was a whole nother night that wasn't on sale to the public and it was a curated performance event to create that atmosphere of uh seeing your culture on stage being surrounded by folks that are also part of that culture i think we had a 98 percent uh black audience and uh it was healing and i think to uh mckeeva's point um yeah, the arts are vital and the arts uh, can be healing. We had a, a, the next play we did, that was a partnership with, um, that was a production of Speakeasy Stage. So we worked with Speakeasy, Speakeasy to uh, produce that blackout event. The next show we did with them was Passover, which took a hard look at, um, by Antoinette Nwandu, who took a hard look at uh, police violence inflicted on black bodies and black communities and director Monica White and Junu uh, worked with a healer. And after every show, we had a healing circle after the experience, knowing that this, the stories on stage, if that is your experience, if that is part of your culture, if that is you're looking on the stage, you're seeing folks, it could be your cousin. It could, for me, I was looking, that could, that could have been me. You might need a moment to, to gather and in the artistic space heal. Um, so I think looking at the theatrical space as a, as a space for healing, also as a space to put forward narratives that inspire difficult conversations. And then how do you handle the folks through those conversations is something that we particularly looked at. So I think I've gone off <laughs> on a little tangent because I was really excited <laughs> about the topic. But um, yeah, so uh, we certainly plan on continuing the Blackout series with our shows. That's something that we um, um, value and people have been responding really strongly. We've gotten national attention. We've written up in the New York Times. I was interviewed by the BBC um, in response to the Times article. So the response has been great. And um, to your earlier point about um, the uh, uh, identifying of racism as a health crisis, I really call on the theater makers as storytellers. Uh, we have wonderful playwrights in Boston of all ages that are looking at intersectionality within our communities. They're looking at ways that um, we need to dream of, 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 of brighter futures for our communities and for our neighborhoods. So I think an investment in the storytellers here in Boston that have uh, the firsthand experience of what is going on in the city and also where they would like to see the city go. The Huntington has a, uh, I believe it's called Dream Boston, where local playwrights are having um, sort of like radio plays of their of their work um, posted and uh, available for like a week at a time. Uh, so more things like that. I'm not sure if, um, Catherine and Makiba, am I breaking up or? or okay. No, you're uh, good. It does. Okay. It, there's something weird happening, but you look great. Okay. okay. So oh, was, uh, that, was that breaking up? Well, I was trying to figure out whether that was you or whether that was my connection. So, okay. So I've got another couple of questions. Um, I, we've not actually fully talked about COVID and transformation. I've been interested in um, the multiple ways in which arts communities across the country have um, really undertaken um, new and exciting and exploratory means by which to um, push art out. And I'm interested in what that has looked like in Boston, what you folks are doing, uh, in particularly in relation to Black arts in Boston, and possibly in relation to transformation. Like, have you learned anything that once we get beyond this particular acute moment, you'll take with you in the future. Maurice, well, you're I'll, not. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited again. And I, yeah. I, I, had, I had coffee late, y'all. So I'm caffeinated still, so no, bear bring with me. It on. Bring it on, bro. <laughs> so first thing, um, we did a lot. And uh, there's been some really exciting um, uh, performances happening over the, the Zoom space. But one thing, the Front Porch, we partnered with Commonwealth Shakespeare to do an education program where we took Shakespeare and looked at that in conversation with uh, writers like August Wilson and also black female playwrights and look at how um, the language, the exploration of language and natural voice and bodies and being fully present in the language in, uh, uh, of all three of, those, of all those playwrights equally. So kind of 
in some ways decolonizing Shakespeare, saying like he's cool, he's great, we love him, but he, there's all these other playwrights that are just as rich and 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 valuable, and especially when we talk about black and brown bodies, really important to our experience. And uh, it was over Zoom, and uh oh, that me? Okay, it was over Zoom, and um, what that did is it increased access, so people from across the nation were able to participate and didn't have to pay the hundreds of dollars to fly to Boston to participate. Uh, we brought in uh, uh, really um, Ruben Santiago Hudson and John Douglas Thompson, folks that are really well. Uh, um, uh, and we had some local heroes like Pascal Florestal involved, people that you know have wonderful careers and that you know all they had to do was like go to the kitchen table and turn on the computer. So the access that Zoom, I mean, that COVID is is uh, providing us is um, uh, 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 something that we're enjoying um, and taking advantage of. In Central Square, we did a. a performance series of uh, local black singers called uh, Spot uh, Front Porch at Spotlight. I'm sorry, um, at Starlight, Front yeah. Porch at Starlight. We have five singers and the whole venue was created uh, with COVID in mind. So everyone's six feet away from each other. The stage is huge and um, everyone wears uh, masks. So that was very successful and all the, we were able to, um, we were the only the fourth company in the nation that would be approved by the Actors Union to, um, give contracts so we pay them the salaries and then all the raised funds went to the pockets of the artist uh so they actually were able to double their salaries through that and um i'm just looking forward to the future i think that once you know god willing when there's a vaccine and a and a what have you still some of the uh the the ways that zoom has provided access um hopefully will be incorporated i mean the classroom i teach in most universities are dealing with they have some students in person and also over Zoom, the technologies of uh, like a Zoom camera and having a screen in the back of the room where people can still interact, I think can transfer into a post COVID world just in terms of access. Uh, um, like certainly post closed captioning is provided, um, is available for folks who are deaf of hard of hearing, situations like that. Thank you very much. Catherine, so what, how is COVID impacting your work? Oh, it's lovely. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll set the stage really quick because I know that time is short. So um, we were set to debut our third year of Bands Festival at Franklin Park. We were anticipating over 10,000 people. We were going to add a third stage, add headliners. I mean, it was like a mini Essence Festival and COVID hit. In March, uh, when, when COVID hit, we also just approved our first strategic plan that never got actualized either. And I'm like, oh man, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? But I realized up until George Floyd, you know, there were there were other killings that happened, and and I realized that my team, who are all volunteer, they give they give their life to this organization. I were were emotionally tired and and almost dispirited um, because they just gone through so much. And so I asked my team to take some time off so that I could focus. Uh, as a visionary of this organization of how we needed to pivot in times of COVID. And uh, talking with a few of my colleagues, I decided to implement some brain trusts with different mm -hmm. external stakeholders who love the organization, didn't know much about it, but want to support, you know, in any kind of way. So I only cash in my asks when they're specific. And so this is the time to make my ask. And so these brain trusts um, were really solving or, or, or deeply examining um, critical issues to the organization that needed a different perspective than what my board and my team were just, we were hitting ourselves against the wall. And so I assembled uh, three of four brain trusts, no more than five meetings, no more than six people. And the goal is either to learn more knowledge or to come up with a strategy or, or a different set of next steps. And then that I learned so much about my leadership and the possibility of what our work could look like after COVID. That Bands Festival uh, now, uh, now and probably forever, given that we're going to be wearing masks for a foreseeable future, that the content matters more than the setup of the actual event. And that so long as we are, to, to Maurice's point, uh, shaping narrative and that the experience is not just centered on blackness, but it is run by black people, um, where the authenticity is there and, and the relevancy is there, uh, we'll be able to have a much more broader reach. 
But also for me, what that what COVID has done is have me look at different ways that content can be shared across platforms. And I know that the MFA has done this too uh, when it came to trying to figure out which platform to offer to the public virtually. But even beyond Zoom, so when COVID hit, Zoom all of a sudden was the hot new buzzword. But it's not the only platform that exists for different types of art. It is a, you know, Zoom particularly is a is a teleconferencing, video conferencing service. It can accommodate and provide, you know, a well-rounded sound or audible experience. So I had to look at other platforms. I had to look at um, the, the, the features of those platforms that are gonna allow for the most possible and most maximum amount of audience engagement, but also shedding light on how do we elevate black and brown artists in Boston in times of COVID where they're not just as prepared. And so we've done some virtual programming um, with the Espinar Association. We partnered with the Loop Lab to test out what, what music experiences would sound like. And we realized that one platform didn't work, so we just kept pivoting until we found what we needed. Um, but what this whole process has taught me, even from an artist standpoint, is how unprepared black and brown artists are in times of COVID. As an example, um, with all the CDC guidelines that are rolled out at the, at the onset of this uh, virus, is that we've only been focusing on the six feet of distance between two people. But when it comes to artists that are performing, those who sing or have a wind instrument are strongly discouraged from performing. That's half of the industry. Correct. <laughs> That makes no sense, but I understand it. So when Starlight Square came out, they not only did the six feet, they did 25 feet from the audience so that artists whose primary source of income is their vocals could still make some money to survive and thrive. So there is work that Bandfest is looking to do with the 300 artists that we work with to prepare them for COVID and how their performance now is shaped forever. That yes, you may be talking to a camera, but that doesn't, it still means you could potentially be in a venue that you're comfortable in or not comfortable in and still perform your best. It might mean that we have to pre record content to give you the best possible chance to be seen by the most broadest audience. It may mean that you need to collaborate so that you get the most out of your creative practice. So COVID has taught us so many things that, that initially depressed me, but um, I realized that you know at this point for black and brown artists, it's really about information sharing and making sure that artists stay up on that information because it affects their business and their livelihood. Thank you. I want to pivot. We've got six minutes, you folks. Um, and I'm interested, I've got two final questions. Um, one is I'm just, you know, I'm still learning the, about the arts in Boston. So I'm interested in what excites you, uh, that's going on in black arts in Boston. And then I'm interested if you were to use five words to, um, describe, um, what sorts of transformation you will be focused on over the next five years, what would those five words be? So what's exciting to you? And in five words, how will you be focused on transforming the arts uh, for Black arts in Boston? Makiba, you know I'm, I'm looking at you. I know, I'm not what? looking at you. Maurice, you wanted to say something? Did you have something? No. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. OK, well, I can tell you what excites me. Um, and it's, it's a, it's a self-serving story. But I will say, like, out of the the gate with COVID, the first public art project um, was the thing that we were able to pull off and that um, covered 107 feet wide, 37 feet tall. It was on location of um, Pro Black's um, high school where he, he went to high school, but it also overlooked a lot of the protests that went past um, during the times that we were closed. It then evolved into an artist in residency that we've documented with a black filmmaking company. Um, it includes art that has been is, is um, in conversation um, around being actually accessioned into our collection. Like for me to be able to take this this quiet moment 
and just keep going. Just keep saying, that's not enough. No, we need to do more. Actually, we would be doing more if these are white artists. Okay, let's just try a little bit further. Let's go. Like, so I'm excited about pushing. I'm excited about continuing to um, use that best antiseptic that there is, which is sunlight, um, to say, you know, you know, we can do better. Like, we can do better. It's not an option. If this city is going to heal, um, then we have to take that responsibility. We can't be afraid of that. It's not as painful as what, what has been. Like, that cannot be the thing that we are afraid of. Um, so I, I don't know about my five words, but they're somewhere in what I just said. <laughs> yeah. I got pushing, 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 and pushing. There you go. Push, um, push, push. <laughs> there you go. So we've got three minutes. So I think take one of the questions I asked. What, did, what either, what excites you or what are your five words? I'm excited by um, the focus on adding Black folks and BIPOC folks into theater leadership and into board membership. And I th I'm, I'm not going to say anything about why it took all this long for the focus to be on that, but I'm glad it's here now. And I hope it's not just for this moment. I hope it's sustaining. And actually, my five rules real quick. Sustainability, community-based, national <laughs> dialogue, innovation, and diasporic. I, I cheated a little. You did it. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna do this really quick. Uh, what I'm excited about is the increased amount of collaboration that is happening amongst black artists, thank goodness, because uh, that did not happen for a while. In terms of transformation, um, challenging philanthropic grant criteria, sustainability, innovation, and real estate acquisition. Hey, there you go. <laughs> Um, I cannot begin to thank the three of you enough for engaging in this conversation. I am um, so honored to be in conversation and in community with you folks. I feel uh, myself very lucky to have listened to you today and uh, your ideas about the arts and, and in Boston in particular. Thank you very, very much. I hope that the rest of your evening goes well. Thank you, audience, for being here with us and for your excellent questions. Um, I appreciate everybody and all of you. All. Everybody stay safe, stay well. I know it's these are hard times. You know, I don't know, eat some chocolate, do, you know, take a walk. Eat chocolate and take a walk. That's what I was saying. Peace and love. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.